recorded. And so we are officially live with our five o'clock session. Welcome all to the Learning for All conference. I am Teresa Gibson and this is our presenter, Angela Westmoreland. Um, I am going to get us kicked off with just a quick welcome from the Friday Institute. Oops, helps if you share your screen, right? Yeah, there we go. So you all can see what I'm talking about. That would be helpful. All righty. So thank you again for joining us. If this is your first session, welcome. And if this is your second or third session, thank you so much for sticking with us today. Um, the Learning for All conference, this is our inaugural year. It was formerly known as the 4T conference. And we at the Friday Institute for Educational Innovation are honored to be the host of this conference. It has already been a very exciting event for us. Uh, for those of you who don't have the privilege of interacting with the Institute on a regular basis, we are glad you are here. We're very excited to be sharing with you today. The Friday Institute is a K-12 outreach arm of the North Carolina State University College of Education. And our directive is to bring research practice and policy together to support K-12 education. And we absolutely love getting to work with you all on a regular basis. And we're so excited that you are here. I'm just going to give you a quick uh, Zoom overview just so that if you have not used Zoom before, you'll be able to navigate your way around this session. If you don't see your controls, you probably have to mouse over the bottom of your screen to see that control bar. You will primarily interact with the chat feature. So if you click on chat, it's going to pop up. Several of you have already found it and let us know that you're here and uh, where you're from. You should be able to use that chat feature. Um, I will be manning the chat. If you have any technical issues, you can reach out to me. But also if uh, Angela prompts you, you can jump in and respond via the chat. She will be able to see and interact with you there. You do have the power to mute and unmute, but we ask that you do stay on mute unless prompted by the presenter. Um, I will also help to man that for those of us who actually forget. I, I'm actually at the office so that my children aren't running around in the background. Um, but we all do. We know it's Sunday and we all know that uh, that, that can happen. Uh, so please do keep yourself muted. If you slip up, I will grab, jump in and help with that. Um, if you want to go to full screen and sometimes when we start to share our screen, you will automatically get directed to full screen. Um, that's fine. But if you are stuck in there and you need a way out, you can just hit the escape uh, button quickly. Zoom also will allow you, you, you most likely have video people minimized at some spot on your screen. You are allowed to minimize those and move them around as you see fit. So hopefully you will be able to navigate around and otherwise you should be all set to go. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and toss it over to Angela who is going to take it away. Hey everyone, um, my name is Angela Westmoreland. I'm the instructional coach at Mac Williams Middle School in Batesville, North Carolina. Wanted to let you know, I'm gonna post the link um, to my presentation in the chat room right now if you wanna follow along. I have a lot of link outs um, that it would be easier for you to follow along that way with the presentation rather than me um, you know, put posting each link in there because I wanted to provide you a lot of um, documentation and um, research that I have used in order to um, to pr create this presentation. So without further ado, can you all see my screen? I hope you can. Okay. Yep, we're good. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Um, so in order to um, talk about this really quickly, I want to let you know this is not the way I would do this live. Um, I would definitely um, not just have a bunch of um, a bunch of slides and <laughs> and just you know talk you through them because I am a teacher who believes very much in blended learning and interactivity. So I tried to make this as interactive as possible in terms of our format. But just to to let you know that um, the blended learning format is very much is very interactive. It is not a bunch of of slides. So I wanted to just give you that disclaimer first off. And the other disclaimer is we probably will not get through all of this material and that's okay. I gave you plenty of time to and space, I hope, to reflect and I want you to take those opportunities to reflect um, as you go on. So if we do not get the opportunity to go through every single thing, that is okay. Just feel free to go through it at, at your, um, your own time. So first of all, you know, in, in conditioning, in keeping with the conditions that Liz Cole um, set up for us, um, technology is important. 
um, you know, we've, we've got um, technology in our classrooms and we know it's important. However, just like she told us before, this is very, very important for me to emphasize that the teacher is still the biggest factor in influencing student success, okay? Um, you know, you can have every student one-to-one -one with a MacBook and the latest technology, and it doesn't matter if you um, are doing all of that and are absolutely not engaging or you don't engage with your students or you, there's no interactivity. The technology is not the focus, the teacher is. Um, this is a quote that means a whole lot to me that I have discovered a couple of years ago and I use it in a lot of my presentations. I'm not gonna read the whole thing to you, but just remember that you are the decisive element in the classroom and that um, you can humiliate or heal. And so again, it's not about the technology, it's about the teacher and the relationship that that teacher has with that student and that group of students. So teaching in the 21st century, we're going to talk about two different things. We're going to talk about blended learning as a means of teaching in the 21st century. And so teaching in the 21st century means that we're meeting students where they are. Um, it's very much, I saw a couple of counselors who are, um, who are joining us and it's, I studied counseling at the graduate level. And one thing that I, that I remember very vividly is meeting people where they are. And we have to meet students where they are. Um, if we don't, we're, we're teaching above or below them. We need to reach them exactly where they are and, and help them to reach levels that they previously could not reach without the current technology. So we need to take it beyond, um, we'll talk more about um, digital integration, but we need to take it beyond the substitution methods of, of using technology. So teaching in the 21st century, I believe, provides students the opportunity to assess, analyze, evaluate, and reflect. Um, what does this mean to me? Um, what can I learn from this? What have I learned from this? What do I need to do next? What should I change for next time? All those, those possibilities need to be provided. So uh, there are three main areas, I believe, um, that are involved in 21st century teaching. The first is blended learning. The second is digital integration. And the third is an effective instru instructional framework. And we'll define each of those as quickly as we possibly can. So blended learning. Um, blended learning gets a, um, a bad rap sometimes because people think that if they're using a computer, or if the kids are on GoFormative or on Socrative or on Google Classroom, that they are techno technologically competent and that they're doing blended learning. But I want to tell you here, these are some of the, the more obvious anti-blended <laughs> learning um, items that I get. I get told these things a lot. You know, well, um, I use videos on Edpuzzle, so I'm using blended learning. Um, no, technically no. Um, you could use uh, you could have a blended learning environment without any technology at all. Blended learning is um, a blend of methodologies and not a blend of paper and pencil and computer. So if you hear somebody telling you that they're, they put a worksheet on Google Classroom, that does not mean that they're doing blended learning. Um, this is a video that tells you what is and what is not blended learning, and I'm not going to have you watch it at this point. Um, you are welcome to watch it at any point. Um, in your own time or you can stop and watch it now if you want to it's linked in my slides that i gave you the link for again um but yes that's absolutely true molly um the teacher never leaves the learning framework um it, it does not replace the teacher blended learning is not something you can do without a teacher in the room it's not robotic it's not you know just simply online that that is an excellent point thank you um so these articles are all linked out um, in the, the um, presentation that I posted, and I'll post the link here again in case anybody needs it. But technology doesn't drive blended learning success, and there are five major benefits of, bl of blended learning. Um, what I've done here um, is, um, it won't let me go back. There we go. Um, what, I, what I've done here is I've linked each of these items to a Padlet. So if you wanted to reflect on any of the benefits of um, the um, of blended learning, you are more than welcome to. Um, and so you can see what other people are thinking as well, or you could talk about it in the chat, that's fine too. But I love Padlet, just disclaimer, I don't get paid by them or anything, but I love Padlet and I love the opportunities it has for instant collaboration. So. Um, one of the things I want to talk to you about really quickly are the five major benefits of blended learning. Blended learning, if, you, if done correctly, is more efficient. It does make education more accessible. Students can pace themselves. They can become more engaged with other students. 
and um, or and the teacher can become more engaged with with their students. One of the things I hear teachers tell me all the time is, well, if I do small groups or I do blended learning, I'm not going to get to all of my students. Um, that that is a, a, a false idea. Um, and when you have small groups and you have blended learning, you actually get to know your students better because you're not just standing in front of a whole group talking at them for 45 minutes. Um, this method is more fun for everyone, and that is absolutely true. Yes, Brian, the accessibility is key to helping all students. Yes, absolutely. When you have more access to the teacher as the student, and when the, the teacher has more access to the students, you can't help but, getting, but get to know each other better and get to know um, each other's strengths and weaknesses. So I believe blended learning has seven focus areas, and I've given this presentation um, several times in different formats, but um, what I did was I, I created an acronym for blended, and the first one is for the B is balanced. And so I believe that um, blended learning is balanced, it has a realistic balance of 21st century and traditional practices, okay? Um, just because it's digital doesn't mean it's better. I hear that a lot. Um, well, I put it on Google Classroom, so that means it's better. No, that is not necessarily true. The focus should not be to go paperless. The, po the focus should be on the learning. What is the student actually learning? Um, and it shouldn't be what the teacher is doing either. And we'll talk about just that in just a few minutes. So um, we should focus on the M and R of SAMR, and we'll talk about that um, as an instructional framework in just a second as well. There's a secret element to blended learning, and again, this is some um, research that I um, that I found um, that John Hattie, I don't know if you've heard of him, um, but he has done a lot on um, classroom management and everything like that. And so even though um, tech, this, this clearly says it's easy to understand why technology often steals the limelight, but it, there are um, missing, missing measures here, and this ranks all of the different things that are important for blended learning. So I encourage you to read that um, at, your, at your leisure. So here's an opportunity for reflection. Um, if you do not use Padlet, like I said, Padlet is um, an open open collaboration board. You can double click or there's a plus button in the bottom that where you can add your own reflections. But I encourage you to think about each of these elements of blended learning in terms of how balanced is your classroom? Are you, are you truly balancing, um, you know, um, 21st century methodologies with, with historical common practices? Are you, are you um, balancing the use of technology with paper and pencil? How balanced are you in your classroom? And I encourage you to think about these things, whether you do it now or later, um, I'll have an opportunity for reflection at the end as well. The L of blended learning to me is learner focused. Um, the learner does the majority of the work in the learning process. I go in so many classrooms where teachers are just exhausted. And a lot of it is because they are standing in front of the classroom presenting for 45 minutes, three or four times a day, the same thing over and over. And um, they're doing the heavy lifting. They're doing the majority of the learning. The teachers already know these things. And so the majority of the learning should be, um, the imp impetus should be on the students. They're the ones that should be learning. They should be participating in reflection and self-evaluation and, and trying to set goals and understand what they should be doing next. It shouldn't just be the teacher who's doing all the talking in the classroom either. Um, those of us who are coaches or um, when you go and do an observation and another, for, of another teacher even, it's, it's critical to sit down and think, okay, what am I hearing in this classroom? What am I seeing in this classroom? Is the student, does the student have an opportunity to say anything at all? There are times when you can sit there and, you know, 25, 30 minutes have passed and the only voice you've heard is the voice of the teacher. That is not balanced and that's not learner focused. So we need to stop and reflect and see um, how learner focused our classroom is. Student-centered learning moves students from passive receivers to active participants. It engages them more. It's an important process. Um, one of the things to make a classroom more learner-focused is to provide student choice. And so I provided an article here for you of student choice during literacy rotations. But also, um, this is a Road to Revolution choice board that I created. The format is based on one by Alice Keeler um, from her Google 
classroom book, but um, it's simply a tic-tac-toe board. But what I did was incorporate a lot of different choices for the students to create a product and then we crowdsource them together. Um, yes, metacognitive skills, thank you, Maria. Those are very, very important because we need to be focusing on all of the senses and all of the things that um, our brain is taking in at one time. We need to um, address all of those, those for the students to learn. So here's an opportunity, another opportunity for you to reflect. Um, there's a Padlet here. And again, this does not have to be done right now. Um, it can be done later, but I, I think it's important to, to reflect and discover how learner focused we are in our classrooms. The E of blended learning, I believe stands for engaging. Um, a lot of times I'll hear uh, teachers say, well, my students are not engaged. And I, I, I hate to turn that question around, but we need to ask ourselves, well, are we engaging? Um, are we engaging our students? Are we spending time intentionally planning for student engagement? And if we're not, then the question becomes, what do we do about it now? Um, now that you know that, that it's not engaging in your classroom, would you, there's an um, author out there that teach like a pirate series and all that, would, would you buy a ticket to your own, to your own show? Um, you know, if a student didn't have to come to your class, would they still come? And a lot of that has to do with relationship, but some of it has to do with um, intentionality, like Brian is saying here, the intention is key, absolutely. Um, how invested are the students in the classroom and in their own learning? What is student engagement? I found this definition to be very, very interesting. Um, it's the degree of attention, curiosity, interest, optimism, and passion that students show when they are learning or being taught, which extends to the level of motivation they have to learn and progress in their education. It's very important for students to feel that they have um, a role in their own education, that they, that they have a purpose behind it, and it's not just to turn something in or get a grade. We have a culture of mediocrity when we are just, um, ex just turn this in for a grade, turn this in for a grade. What is the learning that occurs with it? Um, yes, I love this. Students need models to see what to do when they are asked to self-reflect. Yes, and we as teachers also need to model how to respond to criticism and questions from students. That is absolutely true, Molly. Um, when students don't know how to appropriately, appropriately respond to criticism, they grow into adults who don't appropriately know how to respond to criticism um, or feedback. Just because someone says you can do it better doesn't mean that they're criticizing you. And, or that, um, you know, there are ways to, um, to demonstrate disagreement and other things in a professional capacity that we need to teach teacher, teach students how to do. And in some cases, teach teachers how to do as well. Yes, excellent point. Um, this is a 2013 Gallup poll, but it's still very, very relevant. Um, the, the level of students who feel engaged and it drops significantly um, from grade, grade five through 12 of how engaged students feel that they are in the classroom. And I think that it's an important point that teachers need to realize that um, a lot of it relies, lies with them. Are you engaging? Students need to meet us halfway, and I get that. I'm not trying to put the blame all on the teacher. But if we don't reflect at all on how engaging, engaging we are or how engaging our lessons are, um, then I, I think that some of the fault can, can lie on both sides. This is a very interesting article from, from Harvard, actually, about students being bored out of their minds. And I found it so relevant that um, I am currently pursuing my doctoral studies, and I wrote this paper on a lack of student engagement as a problem in today's schools. And I included parts of it here for you to review um, at your convenience, because I think that boredom is a relevant problem. Um, a lot of times um, we just say, well, it's the student's fault again, but we need to stop and think about, are we planning for student engagement? So the N is um, necessary. I truly believe that blended learning is necessary. We have a lot of jobs that have not, have been, not even been created yet. Um, you know, things that people are already doing that would not have been considered a, a professional possibility 10 years ago. And so the world is just going to continue to change and we have to change with it in a lot of respects. Students should be self-directed. This is an important article um, because it talks about the way people learn and how we need to, um, how students need to be more independent so that they can 
improve upon um, the way that they live and work. Um, and so um, I, I think it's important to recognize that um, students need to be independent and they need to have the opportunity to reflect on that independence. As some of you have said also, um, like Molly said a few minutes ago, we need to make sure that we're modeling for them what that looks like. And so here's another reflection opportunity. When I, when I present this information, I like to give them, you know, the opportunity to reflect after every element of blended learning. So again, whether you do this now or later, um, take a moment and think about what makes blended learning necessary. So the first D of blended is differentiated. This is a word that is thrown out so much. Um, you know, we, we all know that we have to differentiate. We all know that we, you know, that we have 30 to 40 children in a classroom and we're supposed to look at them as 30 individuals. We know that, but um, in the terms of blended learning, without this differentiation, you will not know what the student actually needs. Um, there are a lot of programs out there that will allow you to differentiate your instruction based on grouping and everything like that. Um, I know that there's iStation and iReady and i this and i that. Um, there's so many things that will target and give you data. But the key with data is knowing what to do with it. Um, you know, you can't differentiate without the data, and you can't um, you can't um, meet their needs without the data. But we need to talk about um, data, and that's that's actually the last D of blended, and we'll get to that in a second. In terms of differentiated, I've provided a Quizalyze quiz here in a code if you want to take a look at quiz, Quizalyze. Um, again, uh, I, don't get, I don't get paid by them or anything, but I just love tech tools, so I've included some throughout the presentation. Quizalyze is awesome. A lot of people use Kahoot and quizzes, and Quizalyze has kind of hit the back burner, but I like it because it allows you to set learning thresholds. And so if the student meets the learning threshold of, I think it's, um, you can set it from say 50 to 79%. If they don't um, get 80 or above and they fall between 50 and 79% correct, then they have to um, follow a different learning pathway. And you can set up that they have to review a Khan Academy video or review a YouTube video or something like that in order to, um, to complete that before they go and repeat the quiz. And I think that is so important to give students an opportunity to have a growth mindset. We can't give them the opportunity to have a growth mindset if we don't have one. And so we need to provide them opportunities and model opportunities to relearn and to learn a different way. And I see um, that um, Bobby has said here that that is key. And I'm, 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 I miss that, that <laughs> in the chat, but I'm assuming you're talking about differentiation um, or something, but please feel free to add to that so I know exactly what you were talking about. But it is important to have the data in order to differentiate, um, but not to be to be driven by it. And again, we'll talk about that in just a second. So differentiated instruction, it's not whether, but how. And um, there's a there's a um, an awesome resource here on student centered learning in a blended classroom. Uh, I want you to take a look at those and whenever you have, a have time and here's a reflect on differentiation. And the question I ask them is, um, what do you need to further differentiate and what areas need improvement and what areas are going well? It's important to take the time to think about these things. Um, how are you using data in your classroom? Is it just in a notebook? Are you just talking about it in a PLC? Um, are you just talking about it with, um, with other, you know, with others on every Tuesday or something. It's important to, to think about how you're using that data in your classroom. The second E of blended, getting to the end of our acronym, um, is effectual. Um, a lot of times things will say, um, you know, um, yes, Bobby, I see that having data making use of it correctly, you're absolutely right. Yes, thank you for, for pointing that out. Um, a lot of times, uh, websites and, and everything will say effective, effective, effective. And I thought about using the word effective, but um, honestly, effectual really stuck out to me. And I, I did a little research and looked at the differences between <laughs> effective and effectual. And I liked that effectual literally means producing the planned and desired result. If we are planning for things to be effectual, then we are planning to have the desired result. And so when we have practical and relevant planning and learning, we are we are planning for a desired result. And I really liked the way that it emphasized that 
in the choice of effective, effectual over effective. Um, here's the, some of the research I did on the word. Um, as you can see, I wanted to be very specific about it. Um, they're, they're very, they're very similar, but, um, I love that effectual means, you know, producing the actual result and the desired result. Effectual to me in terms of blended learning is a multi-sensory learning experience. Somebody mentioned metacognition earlier and um, what I included here, I was a social studies teacher before I was a coach and I love social studies interactivity and interactive sites, but I included um, multiple examples here of different things that you might do to increase a multi-sensory learning experience for students. Um, for instance, the if you use Read, Write, Think, which is the ELA and Writing Student Interactives down here, um, they have trading cards, digital trading cards you can create, and they ask different questions based on what you choose for your interactive trading cards. Um, there are interactive sites for World Wars One and Two, and then um, FET and um, Gizmos for math. And I think it's important for students to have the opportunity to literally manipulate, whether that's on the table and they're using actual manipulatives, or whether it's digital manipulatives, they need to be able to manipulate and move things around as much as they can so that they can see what cause and effect um, is working with that, with that data and that information. So four tips to create a multi-sensory e-learning experience. You need to have sight, sound, touch, and storytelling as much as possible. Um, so like with the touch, you know, drag and drop activities, sorting. Um, there are a lot of ways to do that with slides. There are a lot of ways to do that with um, Go Formative or Wiser Me. Um, but it's important to use those, those opportunities for students to manipulate the information. So the final letter of our, our blended learning acronym is D, uh, data informed, um, when students are consistently and frequently assessed. And I don't mean necessarily that they are tested and tested and tested. Um, it's important to offer exit tickets. It's important to offer, you know, short quizzes and to look and see what the students are learning um, so that you can plan for small group instruction and future learning. And that brings us to the important question, data-driven versus data-informed. Um, data-driven to me is way too harsh. I think the data is important. I think it should inform our next steps, but it shouldn't drive every single thing that we do because not everything a student is good at, not every single thing a student knows is gonna show up on a multiple choice test. It's just not. And so um, when we teach and we, um, we pass on content to our students and we facilitate learning experiences, we're going to discover that everything that they know, again, it's not gonna show up at the end of grade test, it's not gonna show up and it's something that we give them. So it's important to remember that we should be informed by data so that we know where to go next, but we should not be driven by it. We should not be obsessed with that, with that, those numbers. Um, and I think that there are some lawmakers that probably need to hear that too. Um, but anyway, let me step off my soapbox on that. Um, and yes, exactly. Um, there are days when they are testing and they may not be having a good day. Just like there are days we have observations and everything is going just as badly as it possibly can. And we are uh, in walks the principal. And, you know, um, luckily, let's hope anyway that we have a growth mindset on those days and that our principal does too. But um, data informed teaching here is um yes absolutely thank you brian it is important to know the difference um i have included a wakelet here um for you this is a collection of articles and resources on data informed teaching i love wakelet um not paid by them either again just you know just love digital tools and love to introduce them to everybody and wakelet is um houses my digital portfolio and houses um all of these articles for you as well so how are you using data? I mean, that's an important reflection. Or if you're not using it at all, then that's important. And if you're using it too much, that's an important reflection as well. Um, you need to, to be guided by things other than multiple choice. And we need to be guided by um, the data in, in terms of what we're, what we're looking at to do next. Um, I created a blended learning reflection tool here for you. Um, I'll take a look at that really quickly. It is going to make you or uh, force you to make a copy. And um, so if you want that, please feel free. But um, it looks like this. It just gives you the opportunity to, to take each element of blended learning and what we've discussed today. Excuse me. And what we've discussed today and reflect on it. 
Um, you know, and I'm, I'm here to help you guide you through this after the, the conference is over, if you want to email me or what have you, but um, it's important to reflect on all of these elements. So digital integration is the second part of 21st century teaching and learning, I believe. So the first is blended learning. The second is digital integration. Um, digital integration has been around for a long time as our keynote, you know, successfully pointed out to us. Um, oh, good. I'm glad that you that you love the reflection. Um, I don't know if my friend Kyle Hamster is in this presentation. Um, he was in, he may be in the other one. Um, he's very busy, but he posted on Twitter recently. If we don't have an opportunity to reflect about what we've learned, then, you know, we're, we may not do anything with it. Um, if you don't have an opportunity for me to reflect, I don't, I don't know how it's going to affect me and what I can do with it. So um, I wanted to include reflection. I had already had that in there, but his tweet um, specifically um, reminded me that it was important to have those opportunities. So I'm glad you, I'm glad you liked that. Um, thank you for that, for that feedback. Um, if you're in North Carolina, I know within the last couple of years, you've, you've seen that digital integration has gone from what is the teacher doing to what are the students doing. And so we have these new digital competencies and all of these things that are important for us to take a look at. If you've never actually seen them, there's a link to them in my presentation. Um, but we must include digital learning. And, you know, if there was a time five or 10 years ago where if you were being, um, if you were being observed as, as formally as a teacher and you were using your smart board and a laptop, then you were digitally competent. And it is no longer the case. Um, it is um, important to remember, thank you, Teresa. Um, it is important to remember that what the students are doing is more important a lot of times than what the teacher is doing in the classroom, especially if it's standing up there using a smart board. Um, Yes, Molly, I'm just, I'm seeing that. Yes, yes, absolutely. The students may not test well. Um, there's a famous story of, um, of some students, I, I don't remember what county, please forgive me, but um, just kind of going off the cuff here, of some students who called a, um, a cauldron a spider because of the, um, the feet on the bottom of the cauldron when it would sit um, on the stove or in the fire. And when they tested, they um, found out that um, the answer was cauldron and many students had no, like you said here, no language acquisition for that. They had no idea what a cauldron was because they called it a spider and they had, they had just had no, no knowledge of what that might be. So the test really did not reflect that group of students in their culture at all. Um, so that's an excellent point, Molly. Oh, you're, oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you for that feedback. I, I appreciate it. I wanted to make sure that you knew I wasn't just making this stuff up off the top of my head. <laughs> um, so it's not just what the teacher is doing, it's about what the students are doing. And it's not just about the new competencies. Digital integration, students learn better when they have some effective or effectual digital integration, not just throwing something on Google Classroom, okay? Um, so how do I accomplish digital integration? What does it look like? I've provided here a digital tools document for you. All I ask is that if you, if you use this or reuse this, please give me some credit. <laughs> I work so hard on this document and I try to keep it as updated as I possibly can, but it's organized by um, category. And so um, if you, you know, want, okay, what can I do with assessment tools or what can I do with assignment and digital activity tools, it will take you to that, um, that section. And all of these link out to tools that I um, feel very strongly are good, um, good, strong digital tools to use in the classroom. So if you have any other questions about that, I've used almost every single one of these personally in a specific way. And so feel free to, um, to use this. Like I said, I'll just ask that you, um, I just ask for credit. I, I would just appreciate it um, because I worked so hard on, on all of this. So I just appreciate that. Um, Woohoo, Quizalize, woohoo. Okay, I, everybody loves this resource. I'm so excited, okay. Um, but um, the last, the third and final, um, uh, piece to 21st century 
instruction or 21st century teaching and learning. So we've got blended learning, digital integration, and effective instructional framework. I want to talk to you about that really quickly. SAMR is something you probably heard before. You're welcome for all the resources. Y'all are so nice. Um, is SAMR is what is the SAMR model and what does it look like in practice? So we've you've probably heard this before. Substitution. Um, is the first one is the S in the SAMR model. So this is basically when computer technology is used to perform the same task as was, as was done before the use of computers. So students take notes in a Google Doc rather than on paper, okay? Um, then there's augmentation. So you can enter your answers into a Google form or a website like Socrative. I know Brian likes Socrative, I love it too. Um, and so they receive their grade insulin when they're finished. We're not saying that the S and the A, the, the substitution augmentation are wrong, that you don't want to ever use those um, computers to do those, but we want to ultimately move over to um, modification and um, redefinition. And so in this case with modification, students would take the notes and then they share them with the group and then they can evaluate each other's words to see if there's any um, details missing. Okay, that's the first step. Then redefinition would even be they could create a Google site or now um, with Wakelet, they could um, crowdsource them in a Wakelet or post QR codes around their classroom for parent night. So we want to get from simply substituting um, the using the computer instead of a piece of paper or, you know, just using it to take a test to, into the modification and the redefinition sides of it. And this is where I got um, my some of my information on SAMR. Um, finally, the Triple E framework, um, which is, you know, Liz Kolb, I mean, this is her, her work. Um, I love Nearpod. Um, I, disclaimer, I'm a Nearpod pioneer. Um, I use Nearpod a lot. If you've never used it, I highly recommend you checking it out. But I integrated Nearpod with this, um, some of my, my information on the Triple E framework. And so, Engaged learning, the students would, you know, you get engage and activate their learning. They learn about the content, um, but then um, in, to enhance their learning, what they can do is they can review their notes or they can review the lesson again, um, and then they can take a quiz, kind of like we talked about with Quizalyze, to determine their next steps. And so for, to extend their learning, they take their notes, create a Wakelet page to curate their resources, um, explain why they included the resource, and then Wakelet links will all be turned in on a Google form added to a Google Sheet um, so that students can view each other's Wakelets when the unit is finished. So that's an extension of the learning. Um, I um, have a few minutes for questions and, and wrap up. I'm going to um, just tell you briefly, this is just my, my contact information, my Twitter handle, and a link to my um, Wakelet for my digital portfolio if you're interested in any of that or contacting me. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now um, and see if anybody has any questions. Oh, the link to my gamification piece. Okay, that was in um, the quiz live slide. I can post it here. Give me just a second. Um, give me just a second to grab that for you. Um, Gamification piece, gamification piece. And Angela, I can, I'm happy to add it to the agenda oh, after the session. thank you so much. I appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, no, like no need online. to find it live. That's fine. Okay, yes. thank you. Thank you. Um, but um, what other questions can I answer for you um, about blended learning? Again, please be reminded that blended learning is not a combination of necessarily of technology and paper pencil but that it is um, a combination of methodologies. Oh, good question, Brian. Um, can you give us some tips on how to transform from data-driven to data-informed approach? Oh, if your admin pushes data-driven. Okay, so yes, um, give me, let me get back to Brian really quickly um, in just a second. Um, yes, young learners, absolutely. Um, there is an excellent resource out there, um, Google Apps for Education for Littles. I highly recommend that resource because they have students using um, Google Sheets and um, Google Slides and everything like that. I highly recommend 
that you check that out. And yes, students can use these most of these resources. Blended learning and flipped learning. So flipped learning really quickly is front loading your information. Um, thank you, Brian. Front loading your information in order to um, be able to have more content discussions live in the classroom rather than spending the time on the actual content. So yes, I do believe that flipped learning can be integrated into blended learning. If um, when you actually have the, the students with you, um, you are actually blending the, the environment into a multi-sensory approach. So if all you were doing would be to front load, like with Edpuzzle or something, you're just pushing a video out or Khan Academy, you're pushing out a video and then discussing it in class, that would be just flipped learning, not blended learning. So blended learning has to incorporate a blend of methodologies from that teacher facilitated to the student and learner focused as a uh, combination. And get back, getting back to Brian's question, I wanted to, um, cause that's gonna take a, a few minutes for me to explain. If your um, if your admin pushes data driven, that is really really hard. But what I would do is I would be um, I would be informed about as much as possible about where my own students were, and so um, I would have my own my own separate um, data, if you will, in order to organize my students into small groups, and I would I would be able to articulate and justify my position for putting my students in small groups because small groups are really important for differentiation. And so if you have your data and you're able to show, okay, I'm using this exit ticket in order to inform my practice that I will pull these students on Wednesday for this small group and then my exit ticket on Wednesday, I will pull these, pull these students on Friday for this small group. I think that is where you can be more data informed than data driven because um, even though your your administration may require certain things in your own classroom in order to inform your your next steps you would be able to um, articulate and justify your organization and so for instance um, at my school we have small groups required on certain days and um, everything like that but what I encourage my teachers to do is to um, use the data that they use that they have on certain days so like on mondays they have an exit ticket that informs their small group for tuesday and vice and you know and so on and so forth and they have that very very organized and so they know that the answers to um to the questions and on the exit ticket for instance if it's a math class you can automatically sort it into three piles when they turn in their exit ticket okay so you can turn sort it into proficient almost proficient, not proficient. And so you can pull those small groups to engage, enhance, or extend the learning to pull in our triple E framework on different days of the, um, of the week. I, I hope that answers your question a little bit. Um, yes, I love that. Um, I love that, Teresa, thank you so much. Um, so how can focusing on the creative use of the tablets be blended? Um, that's really good, a good question. Um, the, a lot of these will work on tablets, but um, there are other apps and things like show the show me app, you know, instead of Google classroom, et cetera. Um, I really like, um, Nearpod again for, um, tablets. Um, they can draw on the tablet. They can, um, annotate all of those kinds of things. Um, it's very important to make sure that you're using the right digital tools for a tablet versus such like a Chromebook. Um, so that's important. Um, and in my tool, my digital tool that I um, provided, um, the digital tools doc, it, there are some that specifically focus on, um, this is for an, a tablet or an iPad. Um, so take a look at that. And if you have more questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, from Ms. Elena Knapp, is how you presented these 50 minutes similar to how you would engage students in their learning in, their cl in the classroom? Um, no. <laughs> um, I, I would definitely um, break this up more. It would definitely be chunked more. Um, the students would have their own um, responsibilities in this presentation. It would, I would definitely not present this um, in this way. As a matter of fact, I'm presenting at NC Ties um, and some of the same content. And I have already built Nearpod um, lessons. So the students will, the students, the teachers, participants will actually go to different stations um, throughout the room to learn about um, 
learn about the the B and the L and the E and the N. So it won't be me standing up there talking. That's a, that's an excellent question. Um, so yes, Miss um, Nixon, <laughs> um, work best with the Open Up Math curriculum again. Um, we are using Open Up in Cumberland County, and what I encourage my teachers to do is to take those slides, slide decks that they currently um, have, and pull them into Nearpod. Um, and if you need more information about that, Ms. Nixon, I am happy to talk to you. Feel free to email me um, through county email, and um, we can talk more. That would, that would be great. Any other questions? Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Um, Yes, I can definitely provide my Twitter handle. Um, happy to do that. I love Twitter. If you're not on Twitter, I highly encourage you to get on there. And so, um, oh, thank you, Brian. Oh, well, y'all are very sweet. Um, I really appreciate every, all the feedback. I really, really do. If there's any other questions, I'm happy to answer them. But um, Great. Thank you so much, Angela. Um, and I will add Angela's Twitter handle to the agenda document, too. So, and, and just a quick closing note, just to remind everybody, if you haven't um, been to a prior session, we all we do have on the agenda, and I'm going to share my screen quickly so that you can revisit this link if you need to. Um, we do have a unique feedback link for every presenter. If you'd like to provide any specific feedback to Angela, please go ahead back to the agenda and click on the link in Angela's box to provide feedback to Angela. Uh, in addition, we do have more sessions this evening and then running again tomorrow and they are all listed on the agenda. It is the same link that go ncsu.edu learn for all 2020 link. I do suggest you, you bookmark that. Remember that as the sessions are being recorded, we will switch out those join us live links with re links to the recordings. Um, and so if you need professional learning credit and we're not able to join us live, if you watch them and fill out the conference survey um, before February 26, we will be able to provide you a certificate for professional learning. Again, they, they are two unique links. One is to provide Angela feedback for the session. And then when the conference closes, we will make available the conference, the overall conference link, which is how you will get professional learning credits should you choose to apply for them. Um, if you'd like to stay connected with the Friday Institute team, you can sign up to receive our newsletters uh, using go.ncsu.edu front slash PLLC dash newsletters dash S. 20 and that will tell you about all of our upcoming things and places that you can connect with us. So thank you all for joining us. I'm going to stop sharing and I will leave the meeting open but I will stop the recording um, in case anyone has any last minute questions for the chat. So thank you all. Thank you all so much. I appreciate it. <laughs>